This is another episode of the Decoding Purpose podcast. My name is Rebecca Tapp, and in every episode of Decoding Purpose, we speak to humans of both influence and impact to explore how life's turning points help us to decode purpose and to ignite a more meaningful and purpose-driven life. Welcome to another episode of the Decoding Purpose podcast. When it comes to guests, I am always intentional about finding people from all walks of life to decode purpose in as many ways as I possibly can. Now, you may ask, why do I do it? Because in every conversation, there is always a golden thread. I can look inside for the patterns, the codes of meaning, and in doing so, I can connect more deeply with one thing. That one thing, our human nature. And you know what? That's awesome because today's guest is also from the chart-topping music group, Human Nature. His name, the one and only Phil Burton. So, what has Phil Burton got to say about purpose? What I want to tell you is that Phil's journey encapsulates what the golden threads of purpose are all about. His story is one that captures the power of a dream, the focus, the commitment, and the discipline to do the work. It is a story about courage, taking risks, and showing up time and time again to do world class to do world class as an individual performer, but also as a team with one focus, the creation of harmonies and rhythm. It's a conversation that is bigger than simply singing a song, although there are so many hit songs from human nature. It's a conversation that's about the meaning behind the music, the joy and the happiness shared with so many people over a career spanning more than 30 years. Finally, this is a story of deep humility. And what I want to tell you is Phil Burton has that in spades. He is one of the kindest people I have the have the honor of knowing. So now I have something to confess. I'm currently trying to make these introductions a little bit shorter with strict instructions from the show's producer. But even if that wasn't the case, and I had an hour to do this introduction, I still wouldn't get through the long list of award-winning hits, albums, and shows produced by these Aussie legends. What I will say is human nature have been at the top of their game for more than 30 years. They have held a residence in Las Vegas for the last 10 years with unprecedented success. And in November 2019, human nature were inducted into the ARIA Hall of Fame. So without further delay, uh, let's, let's get those dancing shoes on and get ready to croon with none other than the Aussie music legend himself, the one and only Phil Burton. Welcome to the Decoding Purpose podcast. Phil Burton, such a pleasure to have you on with me. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. It's a real pleasure to be with you. Well, Phil, I'm actually going to kick off with a question that I ask every single guest on the Decoding Purpose podcast, and it's a a little bit of uh, field research, you could say. Mm -hmm. What I want to ask you is, with regards to becoming a singer and a musician, do you feel that that happened for you because you made an intentional decision to really actively pursue that dream? Or do you feel that your role as a singer and obviously within human nature was a date with destiny? Well, I kind of feel it is a small mixture of both. Um, When I was at high school, I really enjoyed singing and performing. Um, but I never really thought of it as a career. It was just something that I enjoyed as a hobby. I'd always played piano since I was about four years Mm. old. And so I grew up with music, which is quite rare for anyone in my family. I'm pretty much the only member of my family that has musical talent. (laughs) Um, so, so basically it was just building that up. And then when I got to high school, I guess the destiny part would have been that the four of us were all together at the same high school and were all met at the same time. So in a way that's fate or coincidence yeah. or whichever one you want to look at it, um, whatever your thoughts are on that. But, it, you know, it, it was a, a lucky moment, I guess, that the four of us got to meet at the same time. But I think 
there was also active pursuing of that dream as well once yeah. we got together. You know, we, we just did it for fun for the first couple of years, but then we had to make that decision. Once we'd left high school, it was like, okay, do we disband now or just keep going just for fun and get our own jobs or do we give this a shot? So that was the moment when we all decided to really pursue it and I think um, we were successful in that, which is great. I'm sure a lot of people, once they leave high school, try to do that sort of thing as a career and fail um, and we were very, very lucky. Mm. We had some very lucky breaks that for us it became successful. So, yes, very much a mixture of active pursuing of the dream but also a few lucky steps and moments of destiny on the way. Totally. And I can't even begin to imagine the amount of work uh, and the hours you put in even before you met the guys. I mean, you mentioned there that you started at, at four and I think I read somewhere at one point you wanted to be a musical teacher, a music oh. teacher. <laughs> well, I don't know if I ever wanted to be a music teacher. Right. I think um, at one point in my life when I left high school, when we were thinking about what to do with the group, we all, uh, three of us did go off to the university and do different things. And I actually did study to be a music teacher, but I'm very, very grateful and very glad for the kids I would have taught that I didn't get there <laughs> because my patience would have run thin very, very quickly. So, um, yeah, I, I love music, but I just couldn't handle 30 kids in a room at once trying to teach them music. I think my patience doesn't allow for that. Yeah, so, I think you might have been born yeah. for the stage. Yeah. Maybe, maybe. <laughs> so, Phil, I've themed season two of the Decoding Purpose podcast around life's turning points um, because I've found these moments in life can really shape our experience of purpose. Now, in, in doing a bit of research, I have to say it was really hard to hone in on one big turning point uh, for you because you've had so many incredible highlights over yeah, your career. Uh, that said, from your perspective, what event or experience do you think was the most significant in in moulding the person you are today, both um both professionally and personally? Well, I think um, one of the biggest things professionally was that decision when we had, were out of school and we'd been at university for a couple of years. We we were just going in talent quests and actually winning all of them, which is, <laughs> it, it sounds like a brag, but it's actually true. We, we actually won every talent quest we went in, which <laughs> I suppose showed that the idea of turning it into a career was a good one. Yeah. Um, but that was the main thing was we all had to look at ourselves. Mike had just finished year 12. The other three of us had just done our second year of university and just decided, okay, we, we really are. We're at a fork in the road here. Do we continue with our studying and Mike goes off to university or do we all quit what we're doing and give this a real shot? So we sat down at a table, was actually with our mums, but because we were all so young, we sat down at a table at the Tierney's household with our mothers at the table and made the decision collectively that it was time to give it a shot. My parents had always, they'd always brought me up to be the type of person and had to have something to fall back on. But Sometimes that doesn't necessarily work that way. I think sometimes you have to really go for it when the opportunity is there and mm. know that if it doesn't work, there's always going to be something you can do later to fall back on. So we were lucky that our parents, even though they had brought us up that way, agreed with us and said, yes, you have to give this a shot. It feels good. So that was probably the biggest turning point professionally. And yeah. I, I, think, um, I think personally the biggest turning point for me would have been discovering discovering Billy Joel because I, as I, as I said before, I'd started playing the piano when I was four years old and I, I actually didn't really enjoy the lessons and I didn't enjoy the practice. It was, it was really kind of forced on me. My parents were like, You're, we're spending all this money on you getting these lessons. You're going to bloody practice. <laughs> <laughs> Good old Edna. <laughs> so I, don't, I don't want to. I don't want to. But in the end, I had to. I'm yeah. really grateful for my parents now that they did that yep. because it gave me that grounding. But I think when I was sort of around the age of nine or ten, my dad took me to a Billy Joel concert and – it kind of made me go, wow, That's now that's playing the piano. So from that point on, my real main enjoyment was I would listen to Billy Joel records and I would sort of pick them apart and play the chords and play the bits that he was playing. And so essentially from that point on, that was the moment that playing the piano became enjoyable for mm. me and not a chore. 
And I think that was a very big turning point where was all of a that, sudden it was enjoying. Yeah. Was that because it kind of created a vision of what was possible and it gave you that brightness of the future that this is something I could wor- work towards? Uh, no, I don't necessarily think that. Mm. Um, but it just I think one of the things that gives you that kind of purpose towards what you're doing is the fact that you are enjoying it and you have a passion for it. Yeah. I don't think anyone can feel like they're fulfilling a purpose if they're really not enjoying what they're doing. So finding the enjoyment in playing the piano was a very, very important thing or else music would have always been a chore to me and I probably would have given it up. And look, I mean, this is a great segue to my next question because I'd say that that feeling, you're talking about that joy and mm-hmm. the discovery of our purpose in is in many ways the discovery of our human nature, uh, oh. which is, you know, which is a pretty <laughs> good name for there. a band. Uh, not bad, not bad. <laughs> it's not bad. It's not bad. What's the story behind the name? I'm sure there has to be a story here. Oh, yes, there's always a story. Actually, when we first started, we called ourselves the Four Tracks with an X on the end. Very cool. That was the X was very important. <laughs> That's what that. made it so cool. That's so 80s. It, <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. Well, it was back in the 80s when we started, so yeah. it was perfect for then. But we were doing cabaret shows around clubs in Sydney, and the name The Four Tracks, it sounded like The Four Kinsmen or The Four Tops or groups like that. So... It really suited what we were doing at the time, but when we got a record deal with Sony Music, that made us look at the name and think it's it's not a pop group name. It's re- we really need to change the name. We don't really want to be associated with the guys, the same act that was doing Cliff Richard medleys in um, Rudy Hill RSL. So we thought it was time to change the name then, and we just literally sat down and wrote down lists and lists of names. Anything that sounded cool, we would write down. And it was actually Mike who came up with human nature. He just wrote that down as an option and we, we just liked it. I mean, it's a really great phrase. It runs off the tongue really easily and we'd never heard of a band called human nature before. And But as we thought about it, it, it really does kind of suit what we do and, and that sort of mm. leads back to your thing of it in the end for us, singing is just human nature. Love it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I mean, singing is human nature for you guys because having seen you perform quite a few times, it is flawless. You know, you guys are all class and really you make it look easy up there. So, you know, I know that performing at that level takes so much more than putting on a sparkly jacket. It does, um, yes. You know, the, the hours that you guys put in to, to take it to that level. So, with that in mind, I want to talk to you about what it really takes to show up at that level for your life purpose and, and to stay on top of your game as you guys have for more than 30 years. So let's go back to the beginning because mm-hmm. one of the, sure. the first big breaks for human nature came about after a, a visit to Sony CEO Dennis Handlin where you performed a capella version of People Get Ready and landed a contract. Now, Pretty much you had around three seconds to seal your fate. Uh, <laughs> about in, in, that, yes. Yeah, about that in getting that song right. So what is your advice for any young person out there who, who has a big dream or a big idea or, you know, a big audition? What does it take to prepare for that, you know, one song that could change everything in your life? I think, first of all, it has to be a little bit of self-confidence. Mm-hmm. And I don't necessarily think that that needs to be to be there you don't have to feel that confidence when it comes to the confidence of a performer or a musician or any any artist for that matter i think the whole idea of fake it till you make it is actually a pretty good one yeah so if you can fool yourself into thinking that you're confident enough to do it that's probably just as powerful as actually being confident enough to do it so if you can lie to yourself and say yep i've got this then you're looking at it with a positive attitude and that's probably half the battle. And Mm. then from there, it's just a matter of making sure your preparation is done, that you're ready for anything to happen, that at any given moment someone's going to say, all right, sing us a song. And if you turn around and go, oh, oh, I can't do that, then, you know, you've lost. You've lost that three seconds, yeah. That's right. So if if you've done your preparation and you feel confident enough, whether it's false confidence or real confidence, it doesn't matter, then I think that's probably the biggest part of the battle. Mm. Yeah, I love that piece around 
uh, false confidence versus real confidence, purely because confidence, real confidence is something that comes about with practice and time. And you don't always have that up your sleeve when, you, when you're when you taking that first big break. No, so not. I think that's a really interesting thing to, to keep in mind when you're really needing to, to put yourself out there is, is sometimes you do have to fake it until you make it and then put in yeah. the time <laughs> to get confident. <laughs> that's right. Absolutely. Yeah. So, Phil, as as you know, I've worked with professional speakers most of my career, and uh, I can't tell you the number of times the best of the best will literally get off a stage, come up to me, and ask if they did okay. And that's despite having years and years of experience under their belt. Uh, in your speech at the Arias in 2019, where, where you guys were inducted into the Hall of Fame, which I'll loop back into yes. later, but cool. in your speech, you listed a, a few statistics explaining that in 30 years human nature had performed over 40,000 shows and performed to more than 10 million people. Now, with all of that experience under your belt and real confidence, do you <laughs> do you ever have times where you still, you know, doubt yourself a little bit or you get a little bit nervous? And, and if so, what tools do you use to, to shift your state of mind if that happens? Oh, it definitely still happens for sure that there are moments where you don't feel confident enough mm. and you feel like you're not quite ready. Um, the main time that that happens is when you're putting on a new show, something that you haven't rehearsed or performed as much as the, the last show you yeah. did. I mean, over here in Las Vegas, we performed, we've performed over 2,000 shows now. So that feeling doesn't really exist in Las Vegas anymore for us, which is a, a bit of a shame, you know, because it, that's that feeling at the start of a show that gives you that nervous energy yeah. and that adrenaline rush. So that's something that we have to make sure that we push towards and not take for granted here in Las Vegas. We have to realise, okay, well, I'm not as nervous as I can be, but but I can do this and we've done it thousands of times before. So when it comes to putting on a new show, that's when it becomes tricky because you're thinking, oh, I hope the lighting goes right here. Oh, I hope the band play the right thing there because they got it wrong in rehearsal. Oh, I hope I don't forget that dance move because that's, I tripped over last time we tried it. So... <laughs> And funnily enough, you should mention the Arias because our performance at the Arias with the jackets coming down out of the ceiling and running around behind the curtain and all the timing on it was so, you know, it was literally split second stuff and we had never actually got it right until the performance. It always went horribly wrong until the last, very last performance live on TV. So... The nervousness level there. And there's your adrenaline. going to go wrong. Oh, yeah. Here's <laughs> your bit of excitement. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. So the main tools that you can do to use that is that you transfer it into that nervous energy and 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 try to, you try to forget what could go wrong and start focusing on what can go right. And I think, again, that begins to fool you into thinking that you've got it. Mm. And I think that's the most important thing is to have that confidence that you've got it as I said before, and if it takes nervous energy to do that, then just let that nervous energy flow through you and just make sure you're channeling it into the right spots. And and I have to ask, you mentioned before, you know, you get to a point where, where the nerves stop happening. For you guys, do you know that that's the time when it's it's time to start something new or create a new show? Is that a bit of an indicator of, of what's next for you guys if you start feeling that way? Yeah, I guess it is. I mean, over here in Vegas we performed – at a place called the Imperial Palace for the first few years. Yeah. And then we got an offer to go to the Venetian, which was still doing a Motown show that, like we originally started off doing, but very much an upgraded version. And we did that for three years. And then we decided to change to a show called Jukebox, which was a bit more based on our Jukebox albums, classic 50s and 60s songs. And then actually after a few years of that, we've gone back to a bit more Motown um, just because we just feel like Motown, it kind of fits a bit more where we are at. Mm. So for us, it, it is that, that thing. You do get a little bit creatively stifled, I guess, where you just feel like, okay, I need, I need those creative juices to flow and change something out. And here in Vegas, you know, the crowd changes every night, but still after three years of doing the same show, no matter who's in the crowd, it does start to feel a little tired. Yeah. So just for your own creative energy and creative output, it's more, it's very important to change things up now and again. 
Totally. And and I think there are lessons about purpose in that because in some ways your purpose as human nature has never changed in that you're providing people happiness and joy and an experience through your music. But your mechanisms of purpose evolve and change and shift. And, and I think that's something that's important to remember because you can get so caught up on that idea of having one big lofty expression of purpose without realising that it can happen across 30 years with lots to different songs and albums. That's exactly right. And yeah. I think it also can happen in your own individual way as well. You know, you talk about my purpose being, well, you could talk about that more of singular purpose of being a great singer or a musician, but I like to think that my purpose is more that second thing you said, which is that bringing of joy and happiness to mm. people and inspiration, I guess, in a way. And that, that can take up very different, many different facets. You know, you look at someone like a doctor who their purpose is healing people, but there are so many other others out there who are healing people as well, from psychologists, psychiatrists, even down to people like personal trainers who are doing things like that. So in the music field, I think, or the bringing of joy and happiness to people, whether it's from singing or creating a painting or even now that you and I are on this podcast mm. talking to each other and there's some people out there hopefully that are finding entertainment or inspiration out of it and... So that's part of the purpose as well. So it's a, I think pro, for me, purpose is a bit of a broader thing than just, just what I'm doing at that time. I think it can branch out, but it's for me is still my broader purpose is that entertainment and joy thing. Absolutely, and I know there have been some incredible people in your life that have have further inspired that purpose in you. Uh, names such as Celine Dion, Michael Jackson, and more recently in Vegas, I know you worked very closely with Motown legend Smokey Robinson. That's right. Um, so you know, I think in a conversation about purpose, it's really important to be intentional about making sure that we surround ourselves with people who are going to really help us lift our game, particularly if you want to play at the level that you guys have played at. So, <laughs> you know, on a personal level, how did working alongside these musical legends influence you and have caused the success of human nature? Oh, there's been really many ways that we've been mm. influenced by those people. I mean, Celine Dion was the very first superstar that we toured with and we learned very much humility from her she creates a genuine family around her with her crew and her band so we thought that living the life of a glamorous pop star like her would be she would do her sound check disappear back to her hotel for dinner and then you know be whisked around in a limousine but no she did her sound check and we were in the catering room and the next minute in she walked her and her husband they were the only two that walked in and she was singing at the top of her voice and saw us and was like, oh, I'm so sorry, boys. I'm so sorry. <laughs> You're but... like, it's fine. You yeah. Sing. <laughs> that's right. And that's how we met her. And she's so down to earth. I mean, when we then performed with her or, you know, toured with her through Europe, she was performing in stadiums and had a catering tent, not just a catering room, but a full catering marquee out the back of the stadium. But you'd be sitting there having your dinner before the show and you'd get a tap on the shoulder. Oh, is this seat taken? And it's Celine sitting down next to you and saying, so are you enjoying the tour and mm. asking questions about how you're going. So that was, she was the most accessible person and that was really lovely. Um, as far as Michael Jackson goes, he was the opposite of accessible. We met him once in 40 shows. Uh, but from him, we very much learned the art of performing, that of entertaining a crowd. Yeah. He, he was just an absolute master at it. I mean, no matter what you, what you think of the other facets of his life, that kind of the tragic life that he had, um, the entertainer side of him, I don't think will ever be surpassed by many people. He no. was just a phenomenon. So, and Smokey Robinson, he is, he's just a very cool cat, very humble guy. He's, he's seen as a God over here in America. And, and he's he performed just, he with becomes, you guys, right? Oh yeah. Yeah. He yeah. Recorded, recorded with us. He's perf performed with us in concerts. He's showed up at our, con our show in Vegas a few times to be a guest performer, um, he's just a really, really nice down-to-earth guy and one that really is very, very keen all the time to point out that his place in the universe is not in him. He's not – well, it is important, of course, because he does bring joy to so many people, but one of the things that he always told us, someone said to him, Smokey, can you imagine the world without your music? And he said, well, yeah, I can. He said, I don't think – my music, he said, you know, you've got to think of it this way. Sure, I bring joy to a lot of people, but 
if you didn't hear my music for three months, I don't know if your life would change that much. But he said, but if you didn't have your garbage man come and collect your garbage for three months, mm. imagine what your life would be like then. So he's very, very keen to point out that there's a real equality amongst humans, I guess, that it doesn't matter what job you do, the, your role is important. And that's that's a pretty amazing lesson to hear yeah. from someone who's as successful and famous as he is. Well, it's the humility piece, again, that you were just speaking about with regards to Celine. And, and look, and having spent a little bit of time with you guys, I think you guys really capture that um, humility in everything you do as human nature as well. Oh, thank you. We try, you know, we yeah. try to keep down to earth. I think... The four of us are good at keeping each other down to earth, which is a great thing. Well, you know, I was, um, in doing my research, I was nearly brought to tears in seeing you guys at Milton Public School after the bushfires. That was an amazing day. Yeah. So tell me about that because, you know, we're talking about the purpose of music here and you spoke uh, before about, you know, giving people joy and happiness. But what I saw that day was healing. It was beautiful to see you guys in action there. Oh, thank you. Yeah, that was such an amazing day, just being a part of that whole thing, of just being able to bring that happiness to people's faces. Um, You know, we have to sometimes look at ourselves and realise that we are very, very, very lucky in what we do. Mm. So to be able to bring that luck and, and enjoyment of what we do to you know, kids and parents that have just lost everything, literally everything they ever owned is gone, who can then at least listen to us sing and smile while we're doing it. You know that you're doing something really special when that happens. And it's, it's not that you feel special as a person, but you know that your purpose in doing that is a very special purpose. Mm. And and I think this is something that we've seen echoed by musicians all over the world, This the power of music to heal uh, on the backdrop of COVID-19. And, and that's a backdrop that you're right in the heart of that, uh, being based in Vegas at the moment. Oh, yeah. Yeah. How are you guys going with all of that? How are you coping? Well, we've essentially been shut down. Our show finished on March 14th and we haven't done a live performance since. So that's a little bit tricky. We have done a few things on a couple of apps. There's an app called Archipella, which is a really cool app that you can sing along with people from separate locations. We've So we've kept people entertained doing that. We've put out some silly videos of us performing in our mm-hmm. pajamas or our board shorts. Love it. Where can we find those? <laughs> Do it. If they're not up yet, they will be soon. Yeah. And just making sure we continue with that part of our career, we've been trying to maybe organise a couple of live stream concerts yeah. that might happen over the next month or two. And just making sure that we keep ourselves working and keep ourselves moving forward as much as we can. Having said that, that you know, there has been a little bit of an upside because going from performing five nights a week in Las Vegas to then not performing at all at night means that I've got a lot more time to help out at home with the dinner side of things, the bedtime side of things for the kids, hanging out at nights with my, at night with my wife, and it's just. That's a really great thing to be able to be a part of. Totally. So it's a bit of a double-edged sword. I do miss the performing, but at the same time I I do enjoy some of the things that we're doing right now. Mm. And so talk to me about Phil at home because, you know, it's it's easy for us to see you guys on stage and and let's face it, the life of a pop star is one that looks glamorous and, and I'm sure in many ways it is. But on the flip side, as you've just said, you're also, you know, you're also Phil the husband and the son and the dad and, um, you know, you have a, a personal side to who you are and how you live versus the very public profile of Phil from human nature. How do you manage that balance? I think it's important to have interests outside of the the performing. And Mm. for me, I do have that. Um, You know, I I do like watching sport. I love um, love watching my rugby league. As I know, you know, you and your my me and your partner Ash quite often rib each other about the Cronulla Sharks versus Uh. the mighty Sydney Roosters. (laughs) <laughs> I won't, I'm not going to engage in that one. <laughs> I've got to live with that. No, so. I understand. I understand. Go so to is that for me. No. I, <clears throat> um, excuse me. Yeah. No. We, um, so I've got that. I've got a real interest in watching sport. I like playing sport. I go out and I try to I play a bit of golf as much as I can. Um, but also I love being a bit of a home handyman. So I love garden maintenance. I love just, you know, 
like, give me a wall to paint and I'm really happy. Like I can lay, you know, tell me to lay a laminate floor. I'm, I'm, I'm sorted for the week. So for me, the, those real normal sides of things are very, very important. Being able to catch up yeah. for a beer with your mates and, and to just get rid of all the performing thing. I know there are people out there that, and for them, that this might be the way that they like to live is to just completely immerse themselves in it. So when they're not on stage live, they're on stage on Instagram or they're post, mm. post, posting photos of themselves constantly. Um, so for those sort of people, if that's the way they they find their happiness, then fantastic. But for me, that little step away and back into the ordinary life, I think that's the thing that probably keeps me more interested. I think I would start to get a little bit sick of the performing life if I had to do it all the time. Yeah. And what about that lovely lady you met on the beaches of Byron Bay? Does she keep you grounded? (laughs) (laughs) The lovely Justine. Yes, there are always things for me to do around the house and she's quite happily telling me what to do and she knows the type of person I am. I'm gladly, yep, done, I'll do it. So, yes, she really does help to keep me grounded in that way. And um, we're a good team actually because, you know, being over here in Las Vegas – it's a you know it's a very different life for us because we're getting some amazing experiences but we don't have any family support here and we do very much miss our friends as well so the fact that Justine and I are such a tight unit together is really really important and she's made so many sacrifices to be over mm. here for 11 years and I couldn't be more grateful and i know both of both of you plus all the guys from human nature are really flying the Aussie flag over there in Vegas. You know, I was looking at some uh, footage and noticed that you guys always pick out the Aussies in the crowd at your Vegas shows. And I was like, it's so nice to see such proud Aussies over there, you know, doing us all proud. What, what's that like for you? Oh, we, we love that. I mean, being Australian, I think is a, we're very lucky to be Australian. So yeah. I think pointing that out to the crowd and, getting a bit of a team unity thing going on with the other Aussies in the crowd that are there to watch us is a, it's a great feeling. Americans still, r- right from since Crocodile Dundee, they still love Australians. There's such a novelty about us. And to be able to play that up and, and to, you know, to get involved with the Aussies in the crowd and it's, it's a really great feeling to be a part of. Mm. And I imagine there might be, you know, only one other feeling that would give you um, even more national uh, pride than representing Australia (laughs) in Vegas, and that would have been performing the Australian National Anthem at home in Sydney for the Olympic Games in the year 2000. Do you remember that moment? I do remember it vividly. Um, There's actually a bit of a story behind that because – we felt so proud when they asked us to perform it. We thought, oh, this is amazing. You know, for us to be chosen to represent the country meant so much to us. And, you know, it made it get, really did humble us and made us feel just amazing. It was just an incredible feeling. Uh, on the actual night of the performance, a couple of things went wrong and we were we weren't cued at the right time. And when you look back at the footage later... It sure, it looks fine that we, you know, we're singing the anthem, but we're walking. You'll notice that we're walking on stage singing. So as we start singing, we are walking onto the stage, which that's not ideal. <laughs> not ideal. Not ideal. And that the funny thing was that they didn't cue us, and so all of a sudden it was like, boys, you're on, and so we had to start singing and walking at the same time. So we came off stage a little bit devastated. It felt like we like our moment had been ruined. But of course, looking back later. When we saw the footage a couple of days later, it was like, oh, okay, that didn't look so bad. And that was probably the moment that we could shake off that that horrible that feeling, feeling of, of, of failure and, yeah. and feel like we'd done something great. So and I, I can only imagine. We missed out um, on the night. Yeah, I mean, for the four of you, timing and those cues would be so important to your performance. Oh, yeah, very important. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> So, Phil, over the the last 30 years, uh, human nature have really had so many incarnations. And I was having a look at your website and the most recent release is a track that I loved and had a good listen to called Nobody Just Like You. And, you know, in my my humble opinion, it was definitely quintessentially a human nature track. But at the same time, it had this like really cool modern vibe. And, you know, if Justin Bieber had released it, 
wouldn't have been nearly as good as you guys, of course, but, oh, you know, you. I, I would have believed it. It definitely was just really cool and current. So in your opinion, what's the secret to reinventing your purpose to ensure that you and your brand, human nature in your case, stay relevant to your audiences? I think the main thing there is that um, I know Andrew and Mike wrote that song just thinking that they wanted to start writing original music again. I mean, it had been over 10 years since they'd written something original, actually more than that, about 15 years. And so for them it was just their thought was, oh, you know, let's give it a try. And the main thing that came out was the production side that really brought it up to that contemporary sound. Yeah. Um, they worked with a couple of producers who have produced people like Zed and Marin Morris and... Um, and they have worked with Justin Bieber. So getting that sound from them, that's what's brought it up to that contemporary thing, like you're saying that someone like a Justin Bieber could have recorded it. But I think it's the the melody and the song, having been written by Andrew and Mike, is mm. probably that's probably what brings out the human nature side. It de- and it definitely still very much has the essence of everything uh, that you guys have produced. There, There is a certain sound there that was so beautiful that, you know, you'd uh, been able to maintain that. Yeah, and I yeah. think the main thing there is that that we should never have that leave. But you can then you can reinvent your sound by working with other people. So there's always going to be a sound of human nature that we you, it's unavoidable because it's the four of us doing it. Yeah. So yeah, it's a matter of making sure that you work with the right people who get you to achieve whatever your purpose is in doing that. So in this case, it was working with these young contemporary producers that gave it that real fresh sound that we were after. So I have to ask, Phil, what can we learn about shared purpose from human nature? Uh, You know, your band, the band has been just globally successful, but it relies heavily on your ability to literally create harmony together, to have, <laughs> yes. have your timing on point, like just even seeing the dance moves you guys roll out on stage, everything is, is you know, streamlined to the point where you can hardly see any differences between you at different points, unless it's intentional uh, when, you, when watching you guys on stage. So can you crystallise for me what tools or tips you would share about what it takes to work as a team at that level? I think one of the main things is finding out what your strengths and weaknesses are as an individual and mm. how that fits in with the strengths and weaknesses of the other three. So someone who might someone might be really good amongst the four of us at at um at writing banter for a show. Someone might be really good at arranging the music for the band. So it's a matter of letting that person work to their strengths with some advice from the other three but not trying to take everything on and not trying to have all four of us work on the same things all at once because that's it's going to get, cause death by committee. So you just have to make sure that you take advice from others outside the group because sometimes there is a little bit of a bubble situation going on and it's good to get that outside advice. Yeah. But in amongst the group, if you're working with a group of people, is to make sure that you are aware of your strengths and confident enough in your strengths to push them forward but also try to learn what your weaknesses are and know that that's your point when you need to back off and let someone else take control. And, um, and yeah, yeah, that's probably the best way to work as a team is to, to I suppose, be cohesive as four individuals rather than, okay, all the whole team are working on this all at once because, as I said, that's a sure way to kill it. So, mm. yeah, work to your strengths and let someone else work on the things that are your weaknesses. And, and tell me, what happens if one of you do make a mistake? Because I'm sure there, there has to have been one or two over 30 oh, years. Oh, there's mistakes. Oh, yeah. yeah, absolutely, all the time. One of the things is you just hope that the crowd's looking at one of the other three when you make the mistake. Yeah, that helps. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So at any given time, probably only 25% of the crowd see you make that mistake, which is a good thing. Um, but I think um, that, yeah, we do, we can cover for each other when we make mistakes. But at the same time, if you're singing a lead vocal and you forget the lyrics, you're out there on your own, pal, you know. It's yeah. <laughs> but you just have to bounce back from that. The, one of the things is that when you're trying to get people to experience joy and happiness, one, making a mistake is actually one of the things that works the most because if you can laugh it off, the crowd will laugh love it off with you. Yeah. Oh, they, they absolutely Keeps love it. Keeps it real. I remember hearing... I remember hearing a Billy Joel interview where he said that he thought 
one of the reasons people go to see him in concert is um, because as opposed to just turning up the ra- their stereo really loud at home is that people love to see you perform really great, but it's like going to a car race. You, you, you'll see some great drivers, but on the other hand, you might see a crash. <laughs> so I think that's the same in a <laughs> that's concert. That's a great like, analogy, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, the crash is sometimes what's well, more fun than the actual race itself. And I think that's the way in a concert as well. Sometimes it's those little moments of mistakes and errors and one-off things that are the most memorable parts of the show. So, Phil, when it you know comes to the creation of a legacy, only uh, last year Human Nature were inducted into the ARIA Hall of Fame and you were also awarded the Order of Australia Medal. Congratulations. Thank you so much. That must have been such a big moment for, for all of you professionally and, and just on a deeply personal level as well. <laughs> It was. I mean, it's not something, neither of those awards are awards that you actually work towards in your career. Um, of course, the, the Hall of Fame, every person that picks up a guitar or a microphone thinks to themselves that maybe one day they're going to get in the Hall of Fame. Mm. And it is it is a dream that's there, but it's not really one that you necessarily work towards coming true because there are no particular steps you can take to be inducted into the Hall of Fame. you just got to work and work and work and hopefully you're successful for long enough. And with the Order of Australia medal, again, that's you don't do nice things and you don't support charities and, and do those sort of things for the reward. So yeah. to get the reward is a really amazing thing because it's more a recognition that other people are seeing what you're doing and recognising that you're doing good things. And we're really grateful that people had recognised that what we were doing was a good thing. But, um, you know, as I said, it's not something that we went, yep, let's do this because it'll get us an Order of Australia medal. No, no, but, I mean, the, the, and the legacy is, is so much bigger than you. It's it's the joy, it's it's the memories we all have. I mean, I have so many memories of human nature um, and how those songs and those tunes have, have influenced my life, our life, you know. The, I, I think there's an impact there that you could never even possibly measure or know. Oh, thanks. Thank yeah, you. yeah. And like, let's talk about your other legacies, uh, the gorgeous Willow and Xavier. What advice would you yes. give your kids about purpose? Um, I think it is a matter of not necessarily finding your purpose in what you want to do with your life. It's looking into what the sort of person you feel you want to be. I Mm. think that guides you in your purpose more than anything else. Um, You know, whether it be you want to be a CEO of a business, then you have to be a certain type of person to head that way. If you want to be a carer or a healer, then there are certain things that certain types of people that take that kind of purpose as well. So I think for for them, it's not forcing yourself to finding a purpose. Mm. It's looking within yourself at the type of person you are and what you think might make you happy and what might fulfill your life and make you feel satisfied. And if you can find that, that does open up the world of possibilities to a whole bunch of different careers and different jobs. I don't think you just look at one job and think, that's what I'm going to do. I don't think there's very many people in the world who are that singularly focused. Mm. So if you can find that broader purpose in yourself, then that's going to guide you in a certain direction. And then from there you can pick and choose the type of career you want. And I think that's the most important thing is just to make sure that you're following your own footsteps. Absolutely. Great advice, Dad. Oh, thanks. (laughs) Well, look, I've come to my my last question today, although I'm sure I could continue chatting for hours. Um, Of all, you know, of all the songs released by Human Nature over the last uh, 30 years, which song has moved you the most and why? Wow. That is a, that's a tough question. There's been a lot of songs out there. Um, One that has probably moved me the most, I don't necessarily think it in an emotional way. But one thing that really kicked us off for kicked things off for us was a song uh, was telling everybody, and I think you know it's one of those songs that's just so memorable. It didn't particularly go that well in the charts when it was released as the single, and it was our second song that we ever released. But it's one that people still remember, and that's probably 
moved us as a group so much because it's such a fun song to perform. It's it's as so well. true. As soon as you said it, like my teenage self wanted to like just bust into song. Then, <laughs> like, and yeah, yeah, that that guitar riff at the start is yeah. so memorable. That dun, 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 dun. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure any young guitarist in Australia or who grew up with us has probably tried to play that. So yeah. It's that's one that has, I suppose, moved the group in a certain way, and me as well, because it's just so enjoyable. It's you just see people's faces just light up when they hear that riff, and it's a really great feeling. Oh, definitely. And um, Phil, I, I can't tell you how over the moon I am to have had you on the podcast today. Um, not only is is that song making my heart glow a little bit, so is this interview. <laughs> <laughs> I might have to. Oh, well, thank you I might so have much. to go and have a, a bit of a human nature boogie now. I think. <laughs> oh, please do. Go, I will. And turn it, go and turn it right up. I will. I've got, as you know, I've got my little two year old uh, out there. I might might give her a little bit of a a bit of a dance and a, a human nature show. Of my own. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure to have you on the Decoding Purpose podcast, Phil Burton. Thank you so much, Rebecca. I appreciate it. Thanks for joining us on the podcast. If you have enjoyed the podcast, please take a moment to leave us a review. That would be greatly appreciated. And we'd also love you to join the Purpose Movement at Instagram by following us at Decoding Purpose Podcast. Also, a big shout out to our sponsors at Supernova Sound.